Events like the Asia Pacific Rainforest Summit are important to the region because these issues around deforestation, forest degradation, and emissions reductions are really political issues and economic issues. And events like this bring together people from a lot of different countries to explore the problems, to seek challenge solutions, and to try to find a way that they can learn from each other. This event where there's probably a thousand people registered from maybe 20 or 30 different countries is a really good opportunity to do just that. Well, if you think about a lot of the countries in the Asia Pacific region have traditionally been forested countries. Uh, their, their initial economic growth started with the harvesting of timber and the selling of timber for local markets and for global markets. Forestry has always been part of a broader economic development program for many of the countries. The challenge that is existing right now is the fact that the economic development plan of many countries has, has favored agricultural expansion, mining expansion, and associated infrastructure at the expense of forests. By ex explicitly recognizing the role of people and economic development in this year's conference, it means we're really trying to put forests at the heart of rural economic development and make sure it's part of the rural economic development strategy rather than that's something that, is, that suffers from a rural economic development strategy. And that repositioning, I think, is really important as we think about forests in the future. So I think the Asia Pacific region has uh, a couple of big challenges that it's trying to confront. And if you step back and look at the Asia Pacific region, there's about 60% of the world's population. It's the fastest growing part of the region or the world economically over the last 40 years. This combination of a lot of people and a lot of economic activity is creating a big demand for goods and services. And a lot of those goods and services are imported and they come from different countries. So what that means is that there's a big pressure placed on the resource base. For example, with forests, um, a lot of people are demanding more furniture, more building materials, more paper products, things that are directly derived from forests. A lot of people are also uh, seeking to change their eating habits. So there's a, more, there's a preference for greater amounts of protein. That means more land for agriculture and more lands for animals, or more lands for fisheries. So this demand for protein increases the need to supply animal products for the global and the local market. So you, the problem with that is you end up with overfishing, or the problem with that is you end up with overharvesting of timber. I think a third thing that's an issue for the Asia Pacific region is air quality. In whether you're in a rural area where there's burning of forest land as part of the deforestation process, or you're living in an urban area where there's a lot of smog and pollution caused from industrial action or uh, transportation emissions, or from the heating and cooling factories that exist around. So I think these three big issues around land use change, things that are going on with fisheries in the region, and the air quality issues are big challenges for people in Asia Pacific. Well, when we think about what Red Plus is and what it's not, it's not just about what does forests look like and how do we generate carbon emission reductions from that. To me, it's about a different way to think about rural economic growth. So for example, for, for us to maintain forest cover at the appropriate level, there's a number of different things that need to happen. For example, we need to have good, solid, and inclusive land use planning that brings communities and other stakeholders into the discussions and the decision-making processes. We also need to have site-based management of land that takes into account the, the impact on forests. So for example, if we're seeking to manage forests for natural forests for products for local and global markets, can we do that in a way that reduces the emissions compared to the business as usual? When we're trying to build out the oil palm sector or the fast growing tree sec plantation sector, or we're trying to expand mining, can we do that in a way that's cognizant of where existing high value forests are 
so that the forests don't suffer disproportionately from that sort of economic development. And another thing we need to figure out is what are the policies that need to be in place that support good rural development planning and good site-based management. We need to reward good policy or good planning and good practice through policy interventions, and we need to penalize bad planning and bad practice through policy interventions. And I think the last bit is we need to put in a really solid and accurate way to measure performance from an emission reduction standpoint. There are great tools that are out there, and most countries have developed a way to measure emission reductions from forest management in a way that is consistent with the UNFCCC protocols and procedures, and in a way that is driving down the costs of doing so at massive scales. So I think this is, in my mind, this is what Red Plus is all about, a different approach to rural economic development that takes these various aspects of planning, management, policy, and emission reduction monitoring, and incorporates that into a new strategy going forward. I think what we have found, generally, as an organization working on this for the last 15 years, is that it's difficult to finance those different pieces all at once, but I'm feeling pretty optimistic about the future. You know, there, there's, people are talking more and more about blended finance, where you take financing from, say, development banks or bilateral agencies, and you pool that with philanthropic donations from individuals or foundations. You use that combination to attract corporate financing and investment from financial institutions. And each of those sources of funding will be focused on a specific type of an outcome, as I mentioned earlier, whether it's policy, planning, on the ground engagement, community enhancement, et cetera. So I think this is the thing we need to think about with Red Plus is that it's not just a one-off type of project, which is similar to how we've been thinking about things in the past. This is a new way of rural development that requires more sophisticated approaches to management and a more inclusive way of engaging different stakeholders in the process. And I think organizations like the Nature Conservancy and other NGOs have a unique role to play in that space by trying to help advance ideas about multi-objective planning or multi-stakeholder processes. These sort of softer skills that complement the really solid technical capabilities and organization capabilities of the private sector and the government.